the Restaurant Association couldn't point to any research at all that showed the effectiveness of serve safe food handler training either at all or serve safe versus other brands of food handler training. David Ferentold is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter covering financial mismanagement, deception, self-enrichment, fraud in the world of nonprofits for the New York Times. His recent reporting entitled How Restaurant Workers Help Pay for Lobbying to Keep Their Wages Low talks about how the National Restaurant Association uses mandatory $15 food safety classes to turn waiters and cooks into funders of its battle against minimum wage. $25 million from over 3.6 million workers that have taken the training uh, since 2010. Let's talk about David for a second. Before joining the Times in 2022, David spent 21 years at the Washington Post, where he began as an intern on the night cop shift, joined their political staff in 2010, began writing about presidential campaigns, Congress, and the quirks of our federal bureaucracy, including an effort by the USDA to regulate magicians' rabbits. His investigation into Donald Trump's charitable giving, for which he won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting, revealed Trump's repeated misuse of foundation funds to pay off private debts. David's the recipient of the George Polk Award for Political Reporting, a Robin Toner Prize for Political Reporting, and numerous other honors. He serves as a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. I want to talk to David because his article shook the ground in the restaurant space uh, over the last few weeks. Hear a little bit more about what made him uh, take on this article. An article that, uh, what you'll hear from David here, is probably one of the most commented that he's seen in a while on the New York Times website. So I want to catch up with David to hear not just what made him pursue the story, but to hear a little bit more about what David uncovered. Let's bring it in. Hi, David. How are you? Not bad. How are you doing? I'm well. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you, too. To, to jump right in, David, you mind giving it a quick background on yourself? Sure. So I'm a reporter for the New York Times. I've been here about a year. I was before that at the Washington Post for 20 years as a reporter, um, covered all kinds of different things from the D.C. police to the environment to uh, the last few years covered Donald Trump. I wrote about his giving to charity and then about his business while he was president. So uh, and relevant to this conversation, my first job ever was as a waiter at Guadalajara Mexican Grill in Houston, Texas. So uh, that was my first start in the working world. So I, that made me it was I had a particular resonance. The story had a particular resonance for me. So, David, the other day I read an article. It was it, it blew up our slack and a bunch of people sent me text messages and said how restaurant workers help pay for lobbying to keep their wages low. Uh, how did you first become interested in this topic? Well, so I write about nonprofits. Uh, that's my gig at the Times. And uh, somebody that I knew from uh, from covering actually a different subject from covering Trump of all people, somebody that I knew reached out to me and said that they were in the restaurant business. And this person said, look, I know you cover nonprofits. Here's something that goes going on with the National Restaurant Association that I think people don't know. You know, workers, uh, people who are just trying to sort of get by in life, take this uh, class and end up funding this massive organization that lobbies against their interest. Um, I had never heard of the National Restaurant Association or Serve Safe. It didn't exist in, or wasn't a big deal in Texas when I was a waiter. But um, we got to work on it because one of the things we're really interested in in this beat is seeing how nonprofits use the shield of a nonprofit to wield power, to wield influence in Washington. And this, to me, seemed like a classic case of that. I guess what surprised you most as you really dug in? Well, this was a hard story to write uh, because the people, so much of the information about how this works is kept at the National Restaurant Association. Many people, even who are members of the National Restaurant Association, don't know about the Serve Safe or how it works or what it funds. So we had a hard time just finding people who could describe it for us. We called the National Restaurant Association board has like 80 plus members. We called dozens of them. We called members going, you know, board members going back in time and really had a hard time getting anybody to get on the phone and give us details. Um, the way we broke through, though, was we found a public facing. So the thing we wanted to know was how many workers have taken this test, have taken this class, and how much money has gone from the pockets of workers into the pockets of the National Restaurant Association. And the the Restaurant Association would not tell us, wouldn't give us any sort of sense of, you know, even scale. 
And so then we found a public facing database that they maintain, basically showing all the people who've gotten this training set up so that if you or I ran a restaurant, we wanted to run one of our new employees through it to see if they really had the certification they said. We found that that public facing database ran the 2000 most popular last names in America through it, scraped those results and got a number in the millions. And so came back to the National Restaurant Association and said, hey, look, you know, we have a number, you know, we know about how big this is and we're going to use that number. And that's when they sort of broke down and gave us the actual number that we were able to use in the story. It feels like this is a common practice across most trade associations. They have some type of university education certification arm. And, uh, you know, in the name of certifying and developing the workforce of tomorrow, uh, they offer all, they almost control a lot of this programming. And uh, don't let maybe other organizations or partners in for uh, obviously what it seems like is, you know, $25 million in revenue uh, to the lobbying arm since 2010. I guess I understand why. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of groups out there that do certification for their members. I mean, a lot of medical groups do this, you know, they offer continuing education and then they offer certification. The, the thing that's a little bit different in this case is that in those situations, the people who are getting the training and paying for the training are members of the organization, right? The, the doctors who are in the American Ophthalmic Association, for instance, that get the training, the money they're paying for that training at least serves their interest. They're the ones who benefit from the lobbying at funds. In this case, it was different because so much of this funding came from, A, from people who were not the beneficiaries of this lobbying, who were sort of, in some cases, the on the opposite side, and B, came from people who didn't know that's what it was, you know, and we're actually acting under a state mandate. You know, we're, we're, we're compelled by the state to take some kind of training that led them to the serve safe. I think the, the part of the piece that I think hit me, you know, hit me really hard immediately and I kept coming back to is, you know, the conversations, kind of the conversations you had with some of the workers and, you know, the, my Sheik Aran Keo and her reaction. Uh, to it. I mean, guess were there any, I mean, talk to me about that, not just her reaction, but others' reactions. What were, what was the themes that you kept hearing from workers as you dug in? I was really surprised given how long this has been going on and how common serve safe is, you know, it, how many people have to take it millions and millions, how, how little known it is that the money from serve, the money you pay to serve safe goes to lobbying and lobbying for this purpose. I mean, to the point that we talked to people at One Fair Wage, which is one of the advocacy groups that's calling for, um, you know, higher wages for for service workers, sort of the the sworn enemy of the National Restaurant Association, and they paid for Serve Safe at one point. Even they didn't know at the beginning that's what Serve Safe was. So even people like Mashika Ronquillo that you quoted, you mentioned. She's someone who's a cook at a Carl's Jr. in California that we talked to. She is an active in the labor movement. She is somebody who is actually, you know, not just, a, you know, sort of supports the effort to raise wages for service workers, but is like a volunteer works on that. Even she didn't know that when she paid to serve safe, she was paying the other side. And we, we also talked to people who were restaurant owners who didn't know that. So I, I was amazed given how much money and time that has, has passed and how much money has passed through the system just how few people understood how the system worked. Did you take it? <laughs> when I was uh, a waiter in Texas, uh, we had to take alcohol training, which I think we took from the state. But no, I was a waiter so long ago that this was not mandated in Texas. But the funny thing was, so I was a waiter in 1996 when I was in high school. And I used to tell people, man, you would not believe, you know, waiters get this tip credit. So they get like a paltry little salary from the restaurant and the rest is supposed to be made up in tips. So when I was a waiter in 1996, my salary was $2.13 an hour. Um, and I would always tell people, man, you would not believe how little they paid us, you know, how much we had to make up in tips. Uh, and then I learned in the, in the process of reporting this story that the, this restaurant association has been so successful at defending that tip credit system. That's still the wage. If I was a waiter at the same restaurant right now in 2023, I would still get paid two thirteen an hour and have to make up the rest with tips. It's wild. It's wild. Um it's not a fun training, I'll tell you this, because I've seen it. And it's, uh, I mean, the it's interesting, these compliance and safety trainings. I think the Department of Labor reports that nearly 81% of workforce training in America today is cover your, you know, we'll call it skill or, or compliance training, safety yeah. related, uh, legal in nature. And I just wonder about the, you know, the effects on the worker that, 
you know, you can't feel like you come out of this and you're any more prepared. I mean, some of the stuff in serve safe seem is so fundamental and basic um, that I don't feel like that's something that workers got to come out of and feel really empowered and excited about on top of the fact of hearing that they have to pay for it. And on top of the fact that paying for it is something that is often work is now work is working against them. Yeah. So as part of the reporting of this story, I took the serve safe training for California. I took it in Utah and a few other places. It's basically the same everywhere. And you're right about two things. It, it is very basic. I mean, maybe there's somebody else, somebody out there who needs to be told, wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. Don't come to work if you've been vomiting. You know, tell your manager if you have diarrhea. Like maybe somebody needs to be told that, but I would think the majority, vast majority of service workers would watch this and go, duh, of course, you know, I know not to serve moldy strawberries, you know, I know not to drag garbage across the cutting board, you know, th th these are things that probably they already know. Um, and I was, so one of the things I asked was to your point, it seems so simple. I thought, well, maybe somebody's done some research out there to say that, look, we've looked at serve safe. And we know that even though it sounds simple, it makes a difference. And the Restaurant Association couldn't point to any research at all that showed the effectiveness of serve safe food handler training either at all or serve safe versus other brands of food handler training. And when you look at the research in general, what it showed is that in general, the sort of classroom or instructional model of teaching food safety, like you're telling watching a video that tells people to wash their hands for 20 seconds, is so much less effective than a thing like a clock at the, you know, at the hand washing station, some sort of like reminder in front of you that makes it easy to remember to walk, you know, to shows you how long 20 seconds is, you know, things like that, that are not instructional, but like sort of in the moment remind you of what to do, that that may be a much better model to actually make workers safer. Were there any uh, other anecdotes or stories, or if you had a little bit more space in the piece, <laughs> would have made it in, but you kind of left on the, on the um on the on the floor was there anything that you know if you had a little more space that you would have fit in well you know this is a topic where it, there's so much legal complexity i think that's the thing that we would have talked about a little bit more is you know how are they allowed to do this and it, you know we're, we're, the irs would be the the enforcing mechanism here and the irs has been gutted they're very especially on nonprofit issues like this they're very they're very risk averse they don't take a lot of enforcement actions um, but it seems like the the rules around this kind of group of uh, a business league are broad enough that even though it sounds like wow they're running a business under the shield of a nonprofit that what they're doing probably would get would pass muster with the IRS. So we went, we had a little more sort of description of the, the ins and outs of that, but cut it just to say it appears as odd as it sounds, it appears legal. What do you what do you hope to have? I mean, as as a journalist highly respected. It's done done a lot on a lot of fronts over the years. I mean, when you write a piece like this, I mean, it takes a lot of courage as I talk to a lot of people in the restaurant industry who say, oh, we kind of knew that, but now that we read this art, you put it in such a way that it was like, why didn't these this get connected this way earlier? I just wonder, what do you hope to happen what, after a piece like this? What, what change do you do you hope takes place? Well, I mean, you you sort of you can't hope for a particular change just because, uh, yeah, you don't want to be rooting for an outcome and you probably will be disappointed. Um, but um, the thing that I was really pleased by was we have uh, metrics of the times, not just who how many people read a story, but we have a way where people can share and give gift the story. Basically, if you're a subscriber, but you know your friend is not, you can gift them the story and they will that so they can read it without paying for a subscription. And the the numbers of those that this story was shared and gifted in really large numbers, which made made me think, okay, it's reaching people who are not regular times readers. It's reaching people who are, you know, service workers that it, that that this affects their life. So I was glad to see that. It felt like it got to the people to whom this was a you know a, a a close issue. It got to people to whom this mattered in their life. Yeah, the comment section was pretty interesting. Yeah, I say I don't stay away from the comment section, but there was a lot of a lot of stuff. Was there any reactions you received that uh, stand out that's that uh, are memorable? Most people said, you know, what what people said in the story, like, oh my god, I had no idea, you know, and and 
I think there has been an effort by the folks on the from one fair wage, the, uh, the the folks in favor of raising the wage for workers. They are trying to, I think, use this story to try to drum up some either start their own business that will fund them or to try to like get people in California and Texas and other places that mandate this training to take it away. I don't know if that's going to work or not, but that's sort of the next beat of this story is to see whether those efforts to change the legal structure that funnels so many people to serve safe, you know, whether those efforts will succeed. David, you've been gracious with your time. My my last question, uh, and so much of what we talk about on the podcast is about the future of work. So I have to ask you, like, what is your hope for the future of work? A great, that's a really great question. My hope is that we find a model to, so we don't lose the benefits of uh, remote work that we got during the pandemic. I mean, there's so many great things about working in the office, especially in a, an office like mine, a newsroom where it's very open and, you know, you can't replace that. And I go back to the office to get that, but that I hope we find a way to give people the flexibility to work from home uh, and to, to sort of like not lose the good things that came out of the shift in the pandemic, even as we all go back to work. David, thank you for taking time. Thank you. My Sheikar on Keo, 40 years old, a line cook who worked at a Carl's Jr. hamburger restaurant in a private school cafeteria in Westchester, California, as David quoted in his article, said this, I'm sitting up here working hard, paying this money so that I can work this job so I can provide for my family. And I'm giving y'all money so y'all can go against me. I want to move past the minimum wage discussion because that can cloud this whole thing up for a second. I just want to point out that, you know, we're living post-COVID in a future of work moment. We're living in a time when frontline workers were deemed essential, especially in food service and restaurants. Like we're living in a moment where one in two American workers are $400 parking ticket away from poverty, of which 80% are service sector, are the people potentially paying a $15 fee to attend a class that in many ways is like a tax for a job. We talk so much about workers not having skills, yet these are the types of programs act as if they're skill building. It's unfortunate that this is a conversation that we have to have in a moment when we should be thinking about how we get the right people back to work as fast as possible, how we get them in a position to be successful long-term from a career perspective in an industry like restaurants that can make such a big impact. You know, they said during COVID, one in three restaurant workers left the industry and are never coming back. I can't imagine that a $15 food safety class is actually making consumers any safer, given my experience taking this class. Clean your hands before you touch the hamburger. You know, Jaime, when we talked to Peter Capelli, he was on our podcast, I believe in season one, uh, he's a, a professor and leader in the HR space at UPenn. One of the things he talks about is the sad reality that nearly 90% of workforce training in America goes towards cover your ass stuff, check the box, not skill building, serve safe. This would fall exactly in that lane of it's done because some lawyer wants you to do it so they can check a box and make sure that if something goes wrong, they don't get sued, even though uh, it, it, it could have been a fundamental failure for a bunch of reasons. I think what we have to think about is, is this the future of work we want and our people deserve? So I want to say thank you to David Farentold for joining us. Explosive, groundbreaking, revealing, eye-opening, not just for restaurant owners and restaurant managers, but frontline workers and those entering the hospitality and restaurant space. Now, don't forget to subscribe to Bring It In so you never miss an episode. We've got some awesome guests lined up that you're not going to want to miss. Now, back to work.